So welcome to Google. Um, so excited to have you here. And for those of us who have seen the film, um, this is a really, a remarkably fresh and modern film. It's a modern take on that sort of classic high school story. So really want to commend all of you for putting together something really relatable and yet incredibly unique. Um, so we're, we're really excited to be chatting about it. Um, I wanted to start with you, Olivia. I know that this is um, your directorial debut. This is the first film that you have been sitting in the director's seat. Is yes. that right? True. So I, I recognize that this is somewhat of a cliche question to start out with, but I think a lot of us who have seen you um, on screen and on, in film, we're curious about what that transition looked like and how it felt actually being in that director's seat. So could you tell us a little bit? Yes, about yes. Um, first of all, this is very cool. We're freaking out. We're very, very <laughs> excited. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's really interesting. I think the film industry is unique in its kind of fluidity within the roles of the industry. You are allowed and in some ways encouraged to take on different roles from actor to producer to director. And I, I think that's something that's kind of great about the way the industry works, where there is a will, there is a way you are able to kind of move fluidly between those roles. So I'd been producing for several years and I directed short films and music videos and really learned a lot doing that. Um, but when I really wanted to leap into the feature space as a director, I found that the, it, you know, the barriers weren't impossible to overcome. They were, you know, challenging. It is a matter of proving oneself as, you know, stepping out of what people, you know, know you as even within the industry. But I was kind of really pleasantly surprised by the willingness to accept the idea, the concept of, hey, I'm actually going to take the reins and be in charge now. And uh, particularly, you know, from the actors, it's really an honor when actors, fellow actors, uh, agree to be in your film and to allow themselves to be directed by you. It's it's a really amazing experience. And to say, listen, I speak your language. I res respect what you do. I can empathize completely. And now I want to work with you in this different way. I want to kind of take charge. Will you go on this journey with me? So. I was just kind of overwhelmed with gratitude at every moment. I was like, I can't believe everybody is gathering for me to tell this weird story that's in my head. And some of the particularly weird moments that I was, you know, like when I asked them to do a stop motion Barbie sequence where they would be miniaturized into Barbies after they take drugs by accident. And everybody was like, yeah, great. No problem. Going to love doing that. So I will say uh, the transition was really exciting. It took me a long time to build that courage, though. I mean, I'm 35. I've been wanting to direct since I was 23. So it took some time. I started directing shorts when I was like 26 and then music videos from there. But I'm really, really happy to be here. And now I'm hooked and it's all I ever want to do forever. That's amazing. Yeah, 35, super unaccomplished at 35. <laughs> making all of us in our 30s feel bad. No, <laughs> that's great. So for the for, for all of you, actually, what was it that drew you to this project? I know, Katie, you did a lot of work um, in the writing and producing and sort of helping to, to shape some of the story. And for each of you who are in the film, um, I don't want to sort of do a round robin, but for anyone who would like to answer, like, what was it about this film that drew you in? I think for me, just because I got to join first, well, besides Caitlin, actually, um, it was bo it was the opportunity to tell the kind of generational anthem that Olivia was excited to tell. Like when we talked about our favorite movies and the movies that made us want to make movies, it was stuff like Fast Times at Ridgemont High and Dazed and Confused and Clueless and Mean Girls and these movies that not only were funny enough and joyful enough that you could rewatch them all the time, but that also were very timely in terms of the generation they depicted like they're so specific about what it was like to be a teenager at that time and at the same time really timeless in just telling wonderful stories about what it's like to be young and friends and in love and so I have always wanted to make a high school movie like that because I think everyone's emotions are so heightened everyone's selves are so heightened in high school and it's a really a wonderful opportunity to tell a story that's so concentrated that way. But I would also say the biggest thing was wanting to work with Olivia and hearing her vision and hi. And <laughs> um, she had such a clear vision, like a contagiously exciting vision and tone for the movie she was going to make. And I've said before, like, I wanted to watch that movie, let alone be a part of it. And so getting to speak to her about what she was going to do and, and see immediately how extraordinary it was going to be and how talented she was and how fun it was going to be, that was probably the biggest motivator. 
Well, it, it really is. It's it's such a unique take on the high school story. And so for for Caitlin, for Beanie, you know, for both of you being in the space, um, there were and actually for the entire group, there were so many moments where you could sort of recognize that the film could have slipped um, if it had been a different film into some of the tropes that we see just repeated and repeated in high school films. And it really managed to avoid falling into those tropes over and over again. So Caitlin, for your your character, Amy, um, you know, to be in the space, I think this is a slightly selfish question and for our LGBTQ folks in the audience, but um, I was not out in high school and coming out was a much more challenging process. And I think there was a lot of sort of self-justification that a lot of us need to do to exist in the world and be be sort of normal members of, of broader society. And one of the incredibly unique pieces of this film, very personally, was that um, the fact that Amy was queer, I don't know how Amy identified, but identified as queer of some yeah. some stripe, um, was a non-issue. It did not inspire struggle. It was not something that other people struggled with. It wasn't a point of contention in the film. It was just simply a piece of her identity, and that was so refreshing for a lot of us. So I'm curious whether that, is that a reflection of where you see sort of a younger generation moving? Um, and do you think that that is um, something that that was a good reflection of, of high school in general at the moment, since it's been a few years yeah, for some of us. I feel like I feel like well, the the thing about Booksmart, the one thing that attracted me to the script when I first read it was Amy and how much I would have like, I was I was when I first read her, I'm like, oh my god, I have to play her, and I think Booksmart does so beautifully represent the generation that I am currently living in. Uh, I think that. I, I, I feel so honored to play a girl like Amy, and I feel like it's so beautiful that it it wouldn't be in her character bio. It wouldn't say Amy, eighteen, is is queer. She it just wouldn't it wouldn't say that. And I think that it's it's I think it in the beginning of uh, in the beginning stages of like developing her. I don't even think we really talked about it because we didn't want to make it a thing. And in in coming of age movies, you do see the coming out scene normally. And I love how it just, we don't need that in the movie. Actually, the coming out scene is when Molly's character is, is telling crushing me on she's one back crushing on the, <laughs> the jock of the movie. And I, I just think it's so beautiful and I feel so honored to be able to play her. I also love that the film depicts a platonic but deeply, deeply loving relationship between two women that is so beautiful and unique and celebrated in its beauty. But then one of the characters happens to be queer and how that love is never, um, it's just, it's celebrated in a different way than romantic love. And I love that our film gives that treatment to a friendship that involves one heterosexual girl and one queer girl. And I just feel like I've never really seen that much of that, especially in such a young space like high school. Um, and I was really moved by that as well. Yeah, took the next question right out of my mouth. I love that. She's psychic. Um, so on that note, you know, for your two, your two characters really, I mean, the, the bond feels very genuine. Was Did you know each other before coming into this film? Or is that something you developed while you were making it? Well, we realized that we had like sort of passed each other Ships in the, in the world. Night. Just like we had constantly been passing each other, but never actually got to um, have a full That's embrace. That's the girl from Short Term 12. Oh my God. <laughs> She's so talented. And then we finally, we finally met uh, when we both were finally attached to Booksmart, and we were like, <laughs> <laughs> and it was uh, we just met at lunch one day, and we couldn't contain ourselves, and we were pretty much holding hands the whole time, like we were engaged, <laughs> and um, it was it was instantaneous. It's so easy to love Beanie Feldstein, and then we were talking about the movie, talking about prep. And then some, we still can't figure it out, but one of us mentioned, it was I think it was Olivia. It was the three of us at lunch and I, Liv was like, I mean, you could live together. And Caitlin and I were like, can we do that? Uh, is that like allowed in the world? Um, but when you go on location to film a movie, there's this inherent uh, uh, bond that uh, you get because you're, you don't really know anyone else other than each other. So you spend all your time together. But we were filming the, the movie in LA and Caitlin lives in LA and I'm from LA. So we knew that it wouldn't be the same as like being tucked away in this small town where you don't really know anyone, but we wanted to replicate that experience because it's so helpful and so deeply meaningful when you just feel genuinely comfortable and trusting and genuinely love the person that you're looking at all day, every day. Um, and so living together just gave us this like beautiful, relaxed foundation of a friendship so that when we 
layered Molly and Amy on top of it, it felt so easy and so um, seamless. Yeah, it also felt like we were just living in our own world for two months because we'd go to work from like 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., go home and sleep and then have pancakes together, go over lines and then go back to work. <laughs> and it really, we were just on our own time zone and we were spending literally 24 seven with each other. <laughs> That's pretty intense after a little while. So um, for Mason, for you, um, you know, coming in again, I, I just come back to this idea of sort of not playing on these tropes, right? Like we have like the good looking, popular guy, um, but there are lots of layers to that character. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you say so. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Queer you girls can say it. that to you. It's no, cool. of course. Um, um, so, how was it developing that character? And was that was was the the character of Nick analogous in any way to your high school experience? Um, so, uh, no, I was <laughs> th probably the dorkiest you could get in high school, which is good because I feel like that builds character and can sort of <laughs> allow you to see from within and without. Right. Uh, Nick is an interesting character because I love the way it was written as especially at first, very um, jock and stereotypical in that sense, where he's just exudes cool and sort of pushes from within, like, oh, if you're not quite in this circle, you maybe can't hang out. And as it speaks to the rest of the people in this film, I mean, Nico's a phenomenal actor, as well as being a great skater. Caitlin sings like you wouldn't believe, in addition to being a phenomenal actor. And Nick has this side to him where just being... <laughs> Beanie's All right, Mace. Dance. Remember our dance oh, well, I number? Was, I was going to uh, Beanie that. and if you would just give me like two seconds. <laughs> that Beanie is a phenomenal. I mean, she's so good at everything in addition to just being a phenomenal person. No, again, it all ties into the fact that we're all. Let's all go around and say what we love no, about course. Beanie Pelstein. We might as well. Um, that. He sort of brings people in just to be excited and to be happy in themselves. And it comes out even in Molly's sort of fantasy ideal of him that they're dancing together and they can do this thing where you can showcase Beanie's phenomenal dancing skills. And they are amazing. They really, really are. And it was just such a joy to be able to bring that to light because everybody is someone different on the inside than you might be able to get from, you know, first glance. So... It's really a good idea to give people that time to. I love the moment at the party. Um, I love the dance sequence. And Mason had never danced once in his life. Isn't that Ever. remarkable? Not once. <laughs> yeah, no, it was like, and also to be partnering, it takes so much trust and and dedication. And I was just in awe of him. You make but, it so, so easy. incredible. But I love the film. I love the moment in the film at the party when you just see everything Molly had projected onto Nick. Like, she's really mean about him at the beginning of the film. She's like, oh, God, why do I have to deal with him? Why, why, why? And then, obviously, harboring something underneath. But I think the moment where he's just like, I can't believe Molly showed up at the party. And and I think what the film does so beautifully is it takes, specifically through my character's judgment of people, it takes that archetype that you're projecting onto them and completely flips it on its head. And I always say the fact that there's two smart girls, two, three, four, five cool skater kids, two like rich party kids. The fact that there's two of every archetype that we've set out um, for what high school looks like, it, it inherently breaks down that concept and the ideology just kind of crumbles because if you have more than one smart girl and they're interested in different things and they're completely different human beings, then the concept of what a smart girl is ceases to exist and it just becomes complicated, multidimensional humans. And I think Nick is, is such a beautiful example of that in the film because she projects so much judgment onto him and, and then obviously is pleasantly surprised and then devastated. <laughs> Yeah, Nico, I'd say the same thing also for your character, Tanner, that um, really, I think through the film, you're sort of searching for, um, and I, I hate that we've been socialized into doing this when we watch films, but like you're sort of searching for where to place that character. So what was it like for you bringing, bringing that person to life who was also deeply multidimensional and could have been like the offbeat, maybe artsy kid, also possibly a skater, but also super smart and headed off to Stanford in the fall? And Well, yeah, uh, Tanner... Tanner was just basically the tie between the, the skater group, uh, Victoria, who played Ryan, and the jock group, which was Eduardo and Mason. And he was just kind of a, a, a lonely dude there, just kind of cruising around on his four wheels, just <laughs> going about. Uh, but uh, 
<laughs> no, he was he was like just kind of like the 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 tie between the two groups, and um, it was really cool to play Tanner because I could relate to a lot of the things like that I experienced in high school at least. Um, to the same as him, it was rad. Do you want to share any of those high school experiences that oh, were analogous man. to Tanner? Uh, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to to put you on the spot. PG version, please. Uh, ac- academically, um, uh, he, he, you know, he, he ca- ca- <laughs> cared cared more about sports than he did in, in academics, and I'd say that 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 was that was true in high school. You know, I did play <laughs> soccer in high school, and uh, you know, I didn't make it to Stanford, but but Tanner did, so. <laughs> It's all good. Yeah, no. So this film really feels like it comes together pretty seamlessly, and you've done something really extraordinary by creating all of these multidimensional characters that are in this particularly stereotypical stage in their life. So what challenges did you encounter when you were coming across this? I would say particularly, you know, Katie and Olivia, as you were going through this process, there are sort of thousands upon thousands of scripts that are written that could be easily followed. But this, you know, taking it outside of the box can, I imagine, would sometimes be difficult as you're trying to put those characters together. So what was that process like and what challenges did you come across? Well, I mean, the reason that Katie was the ideal screenwriter to come on board and reshape and reimagine this existing material was because she had these incredibly specific and smart ideas of how to expand each character and how to expand the general narrative. You know, I I had pitched on this movie because I loved the concept of two very smart women who love each other and aren't trying to assimilate to become the cool kids or the popular kids. They think they are cool. They're a kind of gangster about their intelligence. <laughs> and I loved that. But I knew that we could kind of break open the rest of the film and, and, and say something bigger. And when I met Katie and I heard her take on it, I was so inspired because she saw exactly what you're seeing. She saw the way to break it out of the box, make everything more nuanced and just deeply m- much, much funnier and smarter. And I was like, this is exciting because we knew we had the opportunity to make something different and to take something people thought they understood and to kind of flip it on its back. But I, I was really amazed um, at the speed and the skill of, of Katie as she kind of reshaped the entire thing. Thank you. Um, uh, one one thing that's really fun that you kind of hit on before too, though, is I think movies and high school are probably the two areas in life where archetypes are the most used and e- you can jump to easily. So like the, the boxes that you put people to in high school, the same way you're searching for characters, like as moviegoers, you're just as likely as the audience to try and say like, oh, that's the hot guy, that's the mean girl, that's the dorky girl. And so we got to play into those archetypes on both levels, both the archetypes that Molly and Amy were projecting onto all of their classmates and the archetypes that the audience would so easily project onto the people that they were seeing on screen. And the dream for us from the beginning was to create a world and an ensemble where any of the characters you would be happy if we just turned and followed that. Like you would watch a whole movie about all of them, which is I think sometimes in movies what you forget to do, like forget to create a world that's full enough to that you would be interested in following all of them throughout the rest of their nights as well. So that was a fun challenge to set up because that's what high school is like also. Like there are all these people you see in a classroom and only defined by the way they interact on the school building and seeing them outside. Like if you ever run into someone from school at like a, I was going to say a blockbuster, which is... (laughs) Yay! Or, you know, like waiting for the horse and carriage to come. Um, and, but like when you see people that you only knew in school, outside of school, like with their families or with their friends, yeah. or like, it was so startling to be like, oh, you have this whole world outside of here that I don't know. And so being able to peel back throughout the night, everyone else in school was, was probably the most fun challenge. I hope that you're contemplating spinoffs, you know, single films for each of these characters <laughs> as well as they go through. We want to see, obviously, Amy off in Botswana. Yeah. You know, definitely Tanner at Stanford. Stanford. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. So um, I'm actually curious while folks line up, I'm curious what the what the origin of this film was. Who originated that that first seedling of an idea? Where did that come from? The script, the original script has was written in 2009. So 10 years ago by two really talented writers, Emily Halpern and Sarah Haskins. And the, it is, it's been around in different iterations kind of in that decade, the core idea being a story about two really smart best friends in high school. And it, I think the story kind of evolved and changed with different people attached to different times in, in ways to 
kind of reflect what it was like in these different time periods as well, even the change for what it was like for young women in 2009 to 2012 to 2015. So that, I think there's been a desire for a kind of movie like this for a long time. And then I felt really lucky that when I came on and Olivia was attached and had this unbelievable vision and just energy towards it that we were able to say like what is the movie we want to make right now and what's the high school movie we feel like we've never seen before it's almost like the society had to catch up with the concept before it could be made <laughs> it feels very much that way when you watch it um, and you know clearly it was it was very impressive after taking 10 years to um, actually make the film and for you being your first time you know it was a very impressive very impressive first try, you know. Thank you. At Google, we like to say um, fail fast, and we're all very familiar with this concept of like failing on the first try. I think you can probably just, you just skipped over that part. 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes for your first one ain't so bad. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, round of applause for that. <laughs> yes. All right, should we go to audience QA? So I have a two-part question. One is for the group, which is, what was the most challenging part of making the movie? And then the second part is specifically for Olivia. You talked about getting to 35 to make that transition to something that you'd wanted to do at 23. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us have dreams and inspirations that we're trying to get to or that we're at. And just any advice you can give in terms of getting over that barrier and, and what that looks like. <clears throat> Sure. Well, I'll take that one first. It's fresh, fresh in my mind. I, um, you know, it makes me think of my mom, actually. My mom ran for Congress last year in Virginia. And it was incredibly inspiring because it was a pivot for her at 66 years old. She'd been a journalist for 35 years, top of her game journalist, produced 60 Minutes for 10 years, Frontline, ABC News, name it, she made it. And uh, seeing her decide, actually, after the 2016 elec election that she needed to, she said, the real resistance is running for office, and I have an incredible amount of respect for her. So watching her pivot at that point in life was incredible. It happened to be the same exact moment I was pivoting. So we were in these parallel tracks of kind of reinvention. And we talked a lot about what that process is like and how really what it is is giving yourself permission and understanding that you're worthy of that reinvention and that you much like we were just speaking of in this film, a lot of the kind of barriers we create are self-generated. A lot of what, we, what keeps us, you know, in a place of acting out of fear is just self-generated. And if you give yourself permission to do whatever it is you want to do, no matter how far it is from what you're currently doing, it's amazing when you realize, like, oh, really? No one else was stopping me? That was just me, huh? <laughs> oh, all right. I wish I had done that a long time ago. But... I, uh, I really, I think it's something that's kind of incredible about being a human being. And I think so often we choose a track at 19 years old. You go to college and you're like, this is my major. Or maybe after college, you're like, well, th that's what I studied. And now I'm picking my career. And like, you really trust a 24 year old to make a decision that should last for a lifetime? No, it's, I think this, the, what stops us sometimes from pivoting is this fear that it will seem like it somehow devalues what we did before, that it somehow implies a hypocrisy of some type that, oh, it'll, it, it means that this wasn't real or, you know, for me, a lot of people have been asking me like, so no more acting, I guess that wasn't your thing. And I'm like, you know what? I love acting. It's catharsis. It's therapy. It's the most fun thing in the world. It, it is something I hope to, to do as well as this. Why do we have to choose? I, I just, I've been thinking so much about it. We make these choices and we put this pressure on ourselves. Why? Like we get one life. We should try everything. Um, and I think for me, it was the fear was like, well, I've chosen acting and I didn't go to film school, so I guess this is, this is my track. And, and then realize like, no way. There are plenty of inspiring um, uh, examples of people who have made that leap and I'm, I'm, I really want to go for it. Also, getting rid of the fear of failure. You know, I love fail fast. It, the idea that just like, go for it. Truly, what's the worst thing that can happen? You don't want to die regretting that you didn't try. So that's my take on that. And then in terms of what was most challenging, I'll throw that to you guys because I just had fun every day and nothing <laughs> was hard. I almost start crying during that answer. <laughs> <laughs> believe in myself um i feel like everything that beanie and i thought was going to be a challenge ended up 
not being yeah. one. At first I was like, Mandarin? <laughs> okay. Um, and then it ended up being so fun. Yeah, so fun. It was yeah. very easy. I think also when we when we first sat down with Liv, she really wanted to stick to the no sides on set uh, rule, which is like, you know, usually on sets, I'll usually have like my lines in rehearsal and everyone's looking at them and it's sort of distracting. And we were like, oh, we're talking the whole time in the movie. And how are we going to do that? And it was so super easy. It was it was great. And then the 26 day shoot also seemed daunting. But then it all like, I don't know, I don't think anything was really challenging. I think for me, the the scariest thing was was Molly herself really scared me. I think. I've in the in the few things I've been lucky to be enough to be in I have always played a very like endearing sweet person and that is who I like to project myself into the world as and I loved Molly but I was also so intimidated by her because at first glance she's not that at all and she's really intense and and unapologetically so and I think that took a lot of um that scared me it took a lot of bravery to kind of not hold back and not say, well, she's not being kind and she's not like nice right now. And that's kind of hard. And, and that's just not who she is. She leads with her intellect. She leads with her passion and she leads with her love of Amy. But other than that, she doesn't care about being pleasant. And that was really scary. And then ultimately really inspiring to me. It's just so funny because when people say the hardest part, like an easy answer would be, oh, four weeks of night shoots is like hard for <laughs> sure. But it never once genuinely felt like I was, you know, pushing myself to do something I felt I had to do. That was part of an atmosphere that was built on set. It's part of having a great cast to support you and push you to be your best inherently. And every day on set was a treat and it felt like I came to do exactly what I loved and it never, you know, I'm sure I speak for all of us when I felt like every time we showed up on set and you could see everyone was excited to be there, everyone was bringing their A game, that it was like, oh wait, this is, we're making something that can, you know, ultimately touch a whole bunch of people. I'm, I'm gonna do my best regardless. So hard is, is funny because <laughs> sure things were difficult in terms of diamond, but it all, it all was a dream. I honestly think the hardest part was like the deep depression that set in as it started to be over. Yeah. <laughs> she says that she that. got married our last <laughs> week of production. I will point that yeah. out. That's true. I don't want to go to my wedding. I want to be with you guys. Connor, hi. <laughs> we love you, Connor. Hello. <laughs> Oh no, I was I was just no no, I was completely agreeing with Katie. Like the hardest part was was being like, Oh, the movie's over. Like we're done filming. That was for sure the hardest part of the whole process. You know? Or other than that, it'd be like, I don't know, hitting like the snooze button on your phone when it your alarm goes off in the morning. You know, that was hard. But other than that, everything Well it sounds like really solid. During the course of this film, you really built it up into a family. And I am sure that spending that much time, you know, we know working on teams, we're doing sprints, you're spending hours and days until my poor colleague Anthony will know what I'm talking about. He has, and I has to spend every day with me. Um, but, you know, sometimes you develop a really strong sense of family and sometimes you don't. So did you have methods for building a sense of trust in between you as individuals in order to help benefit that sort of bond um, that actually came out in the film? Did you have tactics or did, was it simply spending time together that got you all that close? Olivia was a mommy figure during this whole filming. She basically, I mean, Mason, Eduardo, and I, we all had play dates throughout the whole it's film. True. So we so, filmed them too. So it's like yeah, we, we oh, it's on yeah. film. Yeah, uh, you'll see them at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> Amazing. But, Please send those clips. Yes. Oh, of course. To you specifically. There's it, one where a, an orange was sliced with a machete. Yeah, it's a full knight sword. Slow motion, a, a knight sword slice. Yeah, I have a replica Game of Thrones sword. I told you it was a big dork in high school. And orange. we found a bunch You're of oranges. You're in very in good company, by the way. Oh, good. <laughs> Season eight, right? Um, and we were just throwing them at each other, and we would slice them with the, with the sword. But this, is, like, this makes me think of something that's really singular about this cast is that I asked them to do quite a lot outside of the official working hours. You know, I knew that in order for this to work, it would be made or broken by their chemistry. So 
I asked them to hang out. I, they could have said, listen, lady, I'll show up on the days I'm working, but like you can't tell me what to do on the weekends. And instead, everybody was so inspired. Before we started filming, we all gathered to watch Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And the reason I really wanted everyone to see that before filming was because that film is so alive and fleshed out. The ensemble is so real. There are no small characters, no small roles. Everybody feels so nuanced that everyone's making choices. And most of all, they feel like they went to high school together. So I knew we had to, we had to achieve that. And I said, please go hang out. I did send them on play dates and I did, you know, do everything I could to convince them to live together. And it didn't take much. As you heard, they were very into it. And, uh, I really think the movie feels good because of their commitment outside of work. And that's just something you can't guarantee as a director. How do you know? How do you know that you can cast people who will love this project as much as you? It also, it comes from the top down, though, because when your leader is as open and encouraging and warm as Olivia was, it sets a tone where everyone is able to be as open in response. And that is what creates, I think, the camaraderie and the friendship and that vibe. It's like when that is the tone that's set from the beginning, it encourages everyone else to bring not just their A-game and their energy and their enthusiasm like that, but also to to like keep their hearts open the whole time, which is a really rare thing on a set and felt really singular and special here. That's awesome. I think we'll take our Just last out of question. How m much of the cast had actually seen Fast Times before you showed it to them? Many had not. Who, had you guys seen it? Had you guys seen it? No. You hadn't. You had seen, uh, I've I seen, had seen it. it. Uh, uh, had seen Spicoli it. was a big. You know. I'm shocked. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe, maybe half and half. Maybe I know a lot of people came up to me afterwards and said, "Like I never seen that. I love that." And it was really exciting because, you know, Amy Heckerling directed that and Clueless. So it was fun to tell people, like, that great mind brought you that defining generational yeah. anthem as well as one that you maybe saw um, uh, in the 90s. How did she do that? How did she capture the 70s and the 90s so perfectly? It's a real skill. You know, it really does feel like Booksmart could be that sort of anthem for this current generation and what a refreshing, wonderful, progressive, lovely take it is. So um, it is out on May 24th. Everyone's going to go see it, right? Just raise your hand. Yes, 100%. Yeah. All right. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, so thank you all so, so very much for being here. It was such a pleasure. Big round of applause, please. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay.